This is commandment number four. So with commandment number four, that implies that we have three prior to, the, to number four. Three commandments. So if you are here for the first time, we're very glad you came and joined us for our third service. We host three services. Um, we finished a 945 service a while ago. Now we did an 830 service, and this is our 11 o'clock service. And throughout this series, we discover a couple of things. That the first of the commandments was basically God told them not to have other gods before him. The key word was before, because he is a unique God. And since this is the book of Deuteronomy, that implies that Genesis, the first book, Exodus, come on church, you know your Bible. Uh, what's the third one? Begins with an L. Leviticus, Numbers, and then this is where we are, Deuteronomy. The implication of being the fifth book is that the sixth book of the Bible by the name of Joshua is the actual entering or conquering of the land. Implication. It's been 40 years of wilderness going in circles uh, in the middle of nowhere. And prior to that experience, there were 400 years, not simply of slavery, but of worshiping other gods because they embraced the Egyptian culture. So they knew about worship. They just had a lot of idolatry in their system. So in this 40-year journey, Moses through this brand new understanding of monotheism, one God, he introduces the concept that I am a unique God. So no one is compared to me, but here is where the thing becomes very, very crazy for me. And, and again, if I were God, if I had the, the PR department of God, I, would have done, I wouldn't have done this. Because what God did is he took this people that he's speaking to, a bunch of slaves, a bunch of no names, a bunch of, a bunch of idolaters, and he entrusted his uniqueness to them by basically saying, the reason why you should, shall not have other gods is because your faith, which they come from a generation of a lot of faith, they worship all this 400 years of slavery, they worship. And then as they enter the promised land, the promised land is filled with a lot of worship. A lot of faith. So the issue is not faith. The issue is the uniqueness that reflects the uniqueness of the object of the faith. So for us, for them, the bottom line is not just faith, but in this case is the object of the faith that produces the faith of the Son of the God that we worship, which is Jesus. So for us, the Ten Commandments... If we're going to be the generation that goes from simply embracing the person of Jesus, but now developing the mind and the heart of Jesus, we must embrace the faith of Jesus. So 33 years on earth of Jesus were not simply so you can have a major holiday called Christmas and a major holiday called Easter. I'm all for Christmas and I'm all for Easter. But it's way more than just holidays. It's about Jesus modeling the uniqueness of his father reflected on the uniqueness on how we exercise that relationship through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, um, at the end of the conversation from week one, we said that the faith of Jesus, not just our faith, but the faith of Jesus, is tangibly manifested that when we do exercise our faith, it points, it directs people, and in this case, for this people, the nations, because they're moving into nations, not just people, but nations, it, it points them not to their faith. It's going to point people, uh, direct people, to the trustworthiness of the object of the faith. So as you sit in this place, and I'm assuming you want to, or you desire, or you do line up with the faith of Christianity, with the Christian faith, if you were to be a Muslim, a Buddhist, an atheist, or whatever you stand on this faith issue, or non-faith issue, the distinctiveness of Christianity is that we do not believe that you are saved by faith. We believe that you are saved by Jesus. Faith is the vehicle to get to Jesus. Tracking? But Jesus is simply the beginning of the journey. The, the, the manifestation of your salvation is that not your faith, but the trustworthiness of the object of the faith must increase. Now, that was week one. Week two, we got to move fast on this because it's, a, it's Sunday, and I know you got to go and watch the game. Um, no idol worship. 
You cannot make any idols before me. I'm going to say it again. They're coming from 400 years of idol worshiping. And they're moving into the land of a lot of idol worshiping. And the reason why is because even though you are a generation that does warfare, what you do not need, Moses speaking, you do not need is simply for God to protect you from the enemies. We said this in week two. Week two, the reason why you must remain exclusively to me, therefore no idol worship, is because you must be protected, you must need you, you must be protected from me before you get the protection of me. Before you ask for my protection, you're going to be protected from my holiness, from my jealousy, from my exclusivity. That the one thing that you need is not just worship. What you need is to worship the right object, worship the right person. And the right person obviously is God. And this God, this is what you need the protection. Because this God is the God who... Anybody who creates idols, anybody that brings someone's before me, I will visit them and I will curse them. I will punish them, not only to the third generation, but to the fourth generation. The flip side of that is that those who follow my commands and obey me, I will bless them up to the... Ten generations, I mean, a, a thousand generations. Now, the one thing that I want to remind you, because people struggle with the concept of wrath and love, with the concept of punishment and blessings or rewards, and I've said this multiple times, and I'm going to say it again. My 19-year-old is here for the weekend, so I'm very, very excited that she came down for, for the weekend from, from college. I have my 17-year-old, and I have my 15-year-old, which implies it's been a kind of a full house uh, weekend, a little crazy, but it's been good. And, but here's the thing. If anybody tries to hurt or tries to touch or offend my kids, they will know. You will know my wrath. It's going to be pastoral wrath, but it's still wrath. Okay? You will know my anger if you try to touch my kids. Why? Here's the why. Because I love them. Parents, right? So the deeper I love my kids, the, the, the bigger or the increment of the wrath. So when you think about God, God is a both end. Is the wrathful God that is needed. We need justice. We need the God that brings injustice into brokenness. And, and we're going to talk about it in just a minute about that. But obviously, watch this. If this is his wrath to the fourth generation as a byproduct of disobedience or idol worshiping, look at what happens if you obey. So, I think it's a pretty good gig for us. So it's a good God that we worship. Number three, this is last, last uh, not last week, but the week before. You will not, you cannot misuse my, in this case, is the misusage or misusing his character or his name. Because the name of God is the character of God. I gave you the illustration of oil change that my wife's uh, uh, vehicle said 15% of oil life in the vehicle and by the time I took the vehicle to the um, to the mechanic to change the oil he looked at me and said brother you do not need oil change you need oil because your vehicle is operating on 20% of oil regardless whether it's dirty oil or bad oil in other words what I was using I was what I was doing I was misusing the vehicle the same principle applies in this regard that when it comes to the name of the character of God, as I said earlier, the third commandment has to do with us, or in this case, this people. As they walk through 40 years of wilderness and they enter the promised land, how they worship and who they worship, they are expanding, they are enlarging, they are proclaiming the fame of that single worship object which in this case for us is obviously god now here's the question the question is why are we doing this and i hope in the video of fields of faith answer that question because we need to um we need to move from simply believing in the person of jesus to now embracing the character the name the mindset and the worldview of jesus um Ultimately, here is what I want you to think about, because this is where I want us to go for a few minutes. I need you to understand that this worldview, or maybe you want to use the word discipleship, but the worldview is the combination of two things in your life and my life. is the doctrine or the beliefs or the uh, principles that you stand on for us. They involve faith in Jesus Christ.
but they must be or they are connected to the lifestyle that is reflected not on the faith that you have, but your faithfulness. So in Christianity, for us as Christians, our worldview, Christianity, is the combination of both. When we look at this narrative of the Old Testament, the calamities and the, and the four-generation wrath of God, when God visited these people and he punished them and he disciplined, here is the reason why it happened. It happened because the people of God conveniently or naively, regardless of the case, they divorced beliefs with ethics. Doctrine and Bible knowledge with how they treated one another and how they, they saw themselves. So if you are in this place and you're listening to this, I want you to hear that part of the, the why we chose this series and why we believe what we need to do is to embrace Christianity holistically. That at the end of the whole process, as we spoke last week, your faith must be reflected not just based on the things that you oppose or the things that you agree or just because you're not Baptist church. Baptists believe this and this is why I'm here. This is what I don't go to the Catholic church. I don't go to the Pentecostal and God knows I wouldn't go to the assemblies of God. You know, no. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is regardless of where you go to church and regardless of what your belief system is, it must be connected to how you remain faithful. Because apparently what we see through the people of God in this time in history, as they move into the promised land, they became, what's the opposite of faithfulness? You want to say the word unfaithful, but I'm going to use another word more radical. I think they became adulterous. Because if they are related to God in exclusivity, like marriage, when you and I commit adultery, that implies that theoretically, I know I'm supposed to love my wife. Theoretically, or in my heart, I know I'm supposed to fill in the blank. But in practice, I'm doing something else. That's what the people of God did. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to understand this whole principle in a manner that help us to see this Ten Commandments differently. By the way, because I've been emphasizing this next Sunday, we'll touch on this one more time because it will be the last Sunday uh, until the next 500 years. But on the 31st of this month, the Reformation, Martin Luther, the Reformation took place 500 years ago, because these reformers, they married what religion divorced. Martin Luther looked at the church, established church, looked at these religious leaders, and looked at society, and said, you cannot embrace the Bible without transforming your conduct. You cannot call yourself a Christian and do or make decisions outside of the framework of the person of Jesus. That's a contradiction of terms. So here's what I'm going to tell you as I take you into the next few verses. Anybody that dares to practice a worldview that embraces the person of Jesus conceptually and the behavior of Jesus on a daily basis will go through what happened 400 years ago. You will be rejected. You will be persecuted. You will be marginalized. You will get into trouble. Here's the bottom line. Listen to me for a moment. If you're in this place and you are willing to embrace the Ten Commandments or a Christian worldview and you want to love Jesus for the purpose to avoid conflict, to avoid difficulties and tragedy, you're in the wrong church, you're in the wrong religion, you're in the wrong system. I'm more than convinced that anybody that marries doctrine, faith with faithfulness based on the object of the faith, developing the character of that object based on the faithfulness of Jesus, you will be in trouble. You will get in trouble. You will get into situations that you might feel that God set you up. You will be in the situation that you look at Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is like, I didn't sign up for this. You're going to look at Moses, and this is another example. You look at Moses at the beginning of the journey, and he tells God, I am not, 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 not able to talk, so I'm not your man. So conceptually, Moses knew what he was supposed to be and do. He just struggled to put it into practice. Is anybody tracking what I'm saying here? It's the concept of giving up of our faith in the God of the Scripture. So how do we do this? Well, this beautiful narrative, and this is why I'm so excited to speak about this, because, um, again, just thinking about fields of faith, 
bunch of middle schoolers and high schoolers. If you're sitting in this place and you are one of those, if you're sitting in place, place and you're raising one of those in that generation, middle schoolers and high schoolers, you, you need to listen to what I'm about to tell you. Because now, what happens when you marry those two things? What happens when, when, you're, when your faith is reflected on faithfulness? Where this is what happens. You go into chapter 5, verse 12, and he moves into a topic that is extremely important. And he says, you must observe, implying, here's the implication, remain focused, and as you move from slavery into wandering, into possessing the land, there is one single thing that you must keep doing. You must develop, you must embrace, and you must convey to whatever you go and however things turn to continue this practices. What practices? I just gave you three of them. This is the fourth one. Here are the practices that you must look at a day of rest, a Sabbath, day of rest. Now, again, I, I, I just don't have the time to go as extended as I would love to go, but here's what I will tell you. This is a brand new word in the vocabulary of the world in this time in history. This is the world, this is the time in history that if you did not eat, I mean, I'm sorry, if you did not work, you did not eat. For us, it's difficult to perceive that because many of us, we go to HEB with a little card and we just put a lot of food, a lot of groceries for the week or for the two weeks. And then we store those things in the refrigerator in multiple places and as we get hungry, we eat. That is not how these people believe, uh, how these people saw life. In this time in history, whether it was through the manna, you guys remember the manna, coming from heaven through the wilderness, or as they enter the promised land where the manna is going to cease to exist, now they have to work regardless of, of when and how you get your, uh, your, your, your support and how you get your food, how you feed yourself. Here's the bottom line. You begin by understanding that the Sabbath or the day of rest is the day where you proclaim that out of the seven days in the week, where you normally, typically, you eat seven days by working seven days, God is telling them the Sabbath, the day of rest, is nothing else but you telling yourselves, you telling the world, and you telling me tangibly that I am the God who can fit you seven days by working Six days. What's the point? Here's the point. The point is not eating. The point is not six nor seven. What's the point? The point is that whether you work six, five, three, two, or whether you need to get a job, and you may not have a job, but you need to get a job, here's the bottom line. You must learn to depend on me. That is the bottom line. The bottom line is that as you move into this land, into this land that is the promised land, and they have different observations, you must observe what I have commanded you from the book of Exodus, what I have commanded you prior to your existence. There are some things that do not change regardless of your status, financially, emotionally, physically, vocationally. Those things are important, but they are not the most important. So again, the Sabbath, the day of rest, is means to an end. What's the end? The end is that it must be kept or needs to be kept. Say it with me needs to be holy because holiness or being set apart is simply the overemphasis that the dependence that you have in me is simply a vehicle to convey to the nations that you are about to conquer, the nations that I'm about to give you from the Jericho and all these Hittites and all these people around the nations that your dependence is not because you're good. It's not because you're intelligent or smart and capable and gifted. Yes, you are. And I'm glad you went to college and I'm glad you're making big money. But here is the bottom line. How big is the object of your dependence? Because if the object of your dependence is Washington, you need help. If your dependence is your income that you receive every month or every two weeks, you're a man to be pity. I'm a man to be sorry for. You and I know that our economy is extremely fragile. And young people, I'm not want to be pessimistic to you, but as much as I want you to work, work is simply a vehicle 
to convey to the nations that God not only commanded work, but he blessed work by helping us to depend, by taking one day of rest, that it will project the object of that dependence. By the way, when we use the word holy, it's because as we unplug from um, daily responsibilities, has a purpose of the unplugging. What's the purpose? is to proclaim who the object of that dependence is. Am I making sense this morning? Or are you guys hungry just like me? I'm so hungry. You have no idea how hungry I am. Here we go. Six days you shall labor. And then on those six days you must do all of your work. I just want you to look at this verse as this, uh, as this observation and implementation in a brand new culture, in a brand new... I mean, this, this people, once they settled and they became an agrarian culture and they conquered the land and, and the land which are filled with people, they're looking at them and everybody works seven days and they're looking at these guys and say, well, well, how come they only work six days? Well, it's because of this brand new understanding of life that once you introduce that, look at what happens. It is the seventh day. Uh, just, just, just please listen to this. So six days, we get that clear. You must labor. So Paul says, if you don't work or you don't labor, you don't eat. So you got to work. Okay? And you got to do responsibilities. All of this is means to an end. Do not get caught up on the sixth day, day of rest. You know, if you remember Jesus, Jesus confronts the religious, religious leaders and basically says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Right? In other words, here's what I'm trying to say. Do not, do not read these verses as something that condemns you working on Sunday. Some of you are going to go to work this afternoon. Some of you work every other weekend. I mean, anybody tracking what I'm saying? The point of the story is that we are in a time and day where these six days can potentially be other days of the week. But if this is means to an end, here is the end. The end is that the seventh day, the one day that you consecrate in this restful experience of proclaiming the dependence, but not just the dependence, but the object of the dependence is the day of rest. What does that mean? That implies that as you go and as you enter the land and you see See multiple people having multiple observations. Keep yourself focused on what this is all about. What is this all about? That this day of rest is a marker of a covenant that I made with you. If you remember the story in the book of Genesis, when God deals with Abraham, he makes a covenant by creating something that is called circumcision. And it's a symbolism of the blood spilling, the blood covenantal that is unbreakable. We are now circumcised through Jesus, and he shed the blood, so we get a spiritual circumcision today. But for us, in this concept of the Sabbath or the rest, is that in this process of working six days on a seven-week day, it's a reminder that your job and my job, our desire to bring income into our family, our desire to provide for our families, is based on a covenant that this covenant, regardless Regardless of how the week may look, is based in obedience. And this obedience is the result or is manifested in commitment to God. Because you and I know the story. You turn from Deuteronomy into the next book, which is Joshua. And they see the amazing covenantal commitment from God towards them. They look at the Jordan River and they don't know what to do. Just the same way that they didn't know what to do when they exit Egypt and they had the Red Sea in front of them. And God, who is a God of covenants and a God of commitments, he takes Moses' rod and he opens the Red Sea. Now we are 40 years later, God, the God of covenants and the God of commitments, puts it in front of the Jordan River and he opens the waters again. So God tangibly making his covenantal commitment practice. They go into Jericho. Some of you know the story. They take the walls down. And it's just event after event that God shows them his covenantal commitment. Because this is a relationship with God. Please listen to me for a moment. Just as God gives us historical markers that he operated within the covenant that he made to us in Jesus Christ, having a day of rest is the perfect, the perfect biblical view to be reminded 
that whatever God places in my hands, called resources, whether it's money, time, youth, I mean, whatever it is, must be experienced and developed for the purpose of obedience. So as you sit in this place, I'm a pastor, so I gotta get my commercial. And if you're struggling with tithing, if you don't know what tithing is, giving or bringing 10% of your income to the local church, the issue is not money, not in this nation for most people. Now, some of you may be the exception and you're in a very critical situation. And, and I'll just, see, here's the thing though. If you are a middle schooler or high schooler, and if you could just listen to these principles and embrace them, not simply as principle, but as we said last week, as values, when you do get your income, when you do get your first paycheck, and you get your first part-time part, part -time job or whatever you get, understand that those things are simply means to an end. The end is that as you make money and as you are blessed with resources, is so you can proclaim that the God that you work for the God, because you work for the Lord, unto the Lord, is a God of covenants. That in your life, in my life, in your marriage, in my marriage, in our church, in our nation, God has given us enough markers to remember that if we are in this place, it's because He's a God of covenants and He has been committed to us. So money, which is extremely fragile, which can be here today and can be gone tomorrow. Is that true? Money is so one of those things that is extremely important and yet is something that is so futile. It's a tangible way to say that if I can set up 10% to proclaim a covenant, not so he can bless me, but watch this please. I provide or I bring 10% because he has already blessed me. In other words, tithing is not so you can put God on your debt. Tithing is simply saying, the, the whatever income I have received, I understand that the God of covenants is so he, can, so he can use my income to bless what is unblessable. To bless those who are in need. To those who are going through the valley of the shadow and death. Now, after that, because this is not about your money. I, I mean, come on, come on. You, we, we don't want your money, okay? We, we want something for you. I want to say that again. We don't need your money. This is not about getting your money. This is about getting something for you. Because I'm hoping that this is making sense for you and your kids and your grandkids. If you can begin with that 10% and simply understanding that when you bring that unto the house of the Lord, you're giving it to enlarge and to enrich someone else. But the next 10% is so you can enlarge your kingdom. And we call that savings. If you can understand that after you enlarge somebody else's kingdom, now you're going to enlarge your kingdom, now you got to save. Can you imagine, can you have that space and breather that you were saving 10% of your income? Can you imagine that if you have given away 10% and you save 10%, how much you have left? Come on, math people. 10, 10, you have 80%. Can you imagine going through life on 80% of your income? Because if you think about it, most financial problems it's not the absence of money. It's simply that we are so uncovenantal, we are so disobedient, and we are primarily committed to whom? Because if it's in my hand, it's for me, it's only for me, and the rest of the world, bad luck. I'm sorry. That's why you guys are lazy. That's why you don't have. Because I work really hard. Is everybody tracking what I'm saying? Is that changing of the worldview that ultimately is reflected in this manner. Let me finish with this. Once you embrace this covenantal experience and you embrace this relationship with God and relationship with Jesus, look at what happens. You will be, you will have the ability to not forget, which is the opposite of remembering. So now, as you move on, and as you become, come on, in about 300 years from this time, about three and 350 years, you're going to move into the United Monarchy with the first king by the name of Saul, the second king by the name of David, and then his son Solomon. And they are one of the, if not the most powerful nation in human history. I mean, Solomon is the wealthiest man in the history of the world. Everybody tracking what I'm saying? Watch this, please. The problem with Solomon and David is that they didn't remember. 
So Moses tell him, hey, you got to remember. Remember what? Here's what you got to remember. Remember is that as you are blessed, as you work, and as you set apart one day so you can be committed to depending on me, that as you are blessed with six of work, and you are the, 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 the culture that is dependent on me, and you proclaim the object of your dependence, you got to remember that at the end of the day, I am the God who owns everything. And in my justice, because of who I am, I am the owner. You cannot, you will never demand from me grace. Grace is one of those things that you cannot demand. If you demand grace, it's not grace. Anybody tracking? The only thing that you can pray for right now is justice. And God knows this country, this country needs justice. Some of you have lost your jobs, your jobs unjustly. Some of you are going to go through experiences in this life that they're not just, that they're not fair. And you can pray for justice. But through Jesus Christ, when we thought that what we needed is justice, in Jesus, he not, only, he not only presents the owner, but Paul says that we are co-participants of the richness of God. And the beauty of being co-participants is that he extends grace, so now we become, what do we become? Stewards. We're managers. So listen to this verse again. I want you to remember, says God, I am the owner. Do not possess the land thinking that you are the owner. Do not make decisions thinking that this is your body, this is your deal, this is how, no. You, you, gotta, you gotta keep in mind that this commandments is to be reminded that I'm the owner. And because I'm the owner, the grace that I have extended to you is the grace that reminds you that all of you used to be how long how long 400 years so as you enter the promised land and you are prosperous and they will be prosperous as you enter the promised land and you are the, the nation that is known by the monotheism of one god worshiping the one true god and you're going to see this unstoppable force of this warfare that joshua is conquering nation after nation Keep this in mind, that I am the God who has brought you out of the slavery in Egypt with a mighty hand. I am the God that my outstretched arm brought you. And here is the therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the reality that I am, I am the owner and you are the manager. That I'm in charge, not you. That I'm the one who determines how much you make and what you do, what you make. I'm the God that determines whether you have a job tomorrow, whether I give you an answer to the need that you have tomorrow. I am God, not you. And Israel is going to have to learn this principle the very hard way. Because you know what Israel did? Israel became such a powerful nation that when they used to be slaves, now they have slaves. When they used to be the foreigners, now they're in the promised land and they own the land. So now they're receiving foreigners. And God tells them, as you were slaves once and you were foreigners, I want you to treat the slaves and foreigners the way I treated you. So this morning, some of you need to take this home very, very seriously because the message is simple. Work is one of the most easiest ways to convey this message. God has given us six days to work fit us seven on a six week or a six day experience to remind us that in his justice God has given us grace by giving us not what we deserve but what we needed in Jesus we deserve uh, hell but through Jesus Christ he provides heaven so as you go through this week and you see people in need, you look at your condition when you have co-workers and some of your business owners, some of you work for somebody, as you deal with the interact with people, keep in mind that as God treated you and has blessed you, you must bless others. This is why to me, tithing, giving, I mean, those things are just basic things. And as a church, as a pastor of a church, as a father of three, Mary, uh, as a husband of one, I, I'm, I'm just telling you, there is nothing more fun to be married, to pastor, to parent, givers. Nothing more fun. 
The opposite is also true. There is nothing more difficult than to pastor a self-centered church. There is nothing more difficult, and some of you that's your story, to go through marriage with an egocentric, narcissistic person. Parents, if we can instill this principle in your children, I promise you, to see a single, a young person, a high schooler, a middle schooler, tithing just rocks my world. Because in my mind, this is, this is the way I look at this. I look at a tither at that age and I'm saying, that, is, that, that individual has a much higher possibility of success in marriage. Because this given, this, this selflessness is, is holistic, is reflected in every single thing. But if we continue to perpetuate this mindset that is about me, it's first me, if I don't like this church, I go to another church, if I don't like this marriage, I go to another... It's not working for us, folks. So if you are in this place and you would like to embrace this view of Jesus Christ, work. Work is one of the easiest, basic ways to bring the gospel into our lives. Would you please stand?